All right, okay, let's start then, let's do it. Hi everyone, um, my name's Eleanor Conway and I'm a stand-up comedian. Um, I know some of you have been to watch my show, Walk of Shame. Thank you very much for coming, you guys are a scream. Um, I, uh, I wrote this show uh, in early recovery actually and, um, and uh, it's, it's fortuitously gone to be a massive success off the back of it. Uh, it's amazing. Um, so I have um, my story, I'm going to talk about my story. I've got a list of questions that Laura kindly sent over and I've got added some notes as well. So do feel free to sort of post any questions below and I'll try and read them. This feels so unnatural right now. I feel so unnaturally weird, but I'm going to try and get on with it. Anyway, so my, um, my sober date is the 23rd of June, 2014. And so I've been sober um, about two years and 10 months. Um, and uh, it's, it's been going well. It's, go it's good. I recommend it. I recommend getting sober. It's a good thing. Um, for me, like... I have always been a massive drinker. Um, one of my earliest memories was uh, my mum giving me like a, a small bit of wine as a kid, um, like eight, maybe eight or around that, just, you know, just to feel grown up and me just knocking it back and her just going, it's not orange juice. Um, and that's the thing for me. I've always had a bit of a taste for booze. I love it. I really enjoy uh, the way it makes me feel. Um, and I've always been a massive drinker. I've always um, found anxiety or troubled times or I've always been on the search for that ultimate high. You know, for me, a successful night was going out and um, getting so wasted that I'd wake up, you know, in blackout half the time and just in, in quite horrific situations. And I would, um, you know, my, my sort of idea of a good night was the moment before passing out, the moment, moment before passing out and my eyes rolling to the back of my head and just like floating away and all my troubles just kind of melting into nothing and, and that would be a great night. And that's, and that's pretty much how I've, I've lived, you know, up until two and a half years ago, I would say. Um, I, um, I think we've all got our boozy stories, so I'm not going to sort of like languish too much on those because I think we all know and it's you know um but in terms of um how I felt and the point of stopping I think I felt I think I got to the point I knew that I wanted to quit alcohol um probably for about three years before and um I knew that there was something different out there but I didn't have the tools or the skills or the knowledge to live that way I think sometimes I think about pre-recovery and, and in recovery. I feel like it's almost like when you are a kid and you ask your dad or your parent or your mum something and they go, and it's a bit of an adult question, they'll go, I'll tell you when you're older, right? And you can't ever understand or fathom what it's like to be older. You can't understand as a child what it's like to be older. But then when you get there, it all makes sense. And I think for me, that's that's what sobriety and, and the last three years has been about, really. Um, in terms of my point of stopping, it, it well, my life was just very Groundhog Day. It was, you know, it was waking up at four, getting up, eating something and getting ready to do it again. That's essentially what my life was a bit like. I didn't have any uh, nine to five job to... Um, you know, to get up for, I couldn't keep down a job. I got fired from so many jobs uh, and uh, it, just didn't, it just didn't work out for me. And I felt like, I felt like a bit like a failure. And I would say the thing that, that drove me, um, that made me think that I had to change my life was, um, was actually professional envy. <laughs> professional envy. Because I lived, I had this sort of persona that I, that I kind of had when I was drunk or on it and that would be telling a random in a house party at five o'clock in the morning about how I was going to change the world 
but the fact is I had no job. I barely knew the people around and they would just support, you know, they would support whatever bullshit I was coming out with, you know, um, and whatever sort of perception of myself I wanted to put out there. But then when I started to see people around me gain success, I felt very like it, it pierced through the bubble of the reality that I'd set up for myself. And it was very like, it was like, oh, it was a bit of a wake up call. And I had all the, the misdemeanors, you know, waking up in hospital, waking up in just random parts of London, waking up in bed with people and just not knowing how I got there. Just, you know, the whole cacophony, waking up just, yeah, just everywhere, like, in covered in sick, just, oh, it was just like, you know, it was just, it was just constant and it wasn't getting any better. It kind of gone through that really fun stage and it was kind of getting to the point where I was doing it solo a lot of the time or with people that I just met. And I would, I would often sort of say, you know, say goodbye to my friends on, on Friday on 11 o'clock at night and then just sort of hop from social, social group to social group and, and, and do that over the course of the weekend. You know, I live in, I live in central London and that is, that allow, that just the way I live and, and the, the, the stuff that I've sat around myself allows that to happen and allows myself, you know, it allowed me to do it. It wasn't like I had a kid uh, and a husband and a job. So I kind of set myself up in this sort of very, very sort of, I don't know, like not growing up sensibility, living in a shared house on, you know, in the middle of like postgraduate partyville really. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm in my thirties. I'm supposed to have, <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be an adult and stuff. Um, so for me, the point of stopping was, well, it was, it was brewing for three years. And then I think I did a sort of like a weird, like my Facebook post, every time I, every time I log on and I see like a time hop Facebook post, it's, it's, and from like over three years ago, it's, it's generally along the lines of, oh my God, I'm so hungover. Or yeah, just a picture of me worse for wear. And that, and that, and that's what, that's what, that's what saved me actually. Facebook, a Facebook post. I posted on um, my Facebook profile. Oh my God, I've been out for three days. Whoa, what a bender. Um, and uh, someone reached out to me and um, I asked him how he got sober. And then he uh, took me to a meeting. And that's where it started for me. Um, um, and yeah i mean yeah yeah that's where it started for me and i'm i'm kind of like i'm in an earring so i don't know how to talk about the next bit i mean the next bit is really like um how did i stay sober well i'm in a fellowship i'm sure you'll know which one um and uh i uh i found that beneficial and really really helpful for me because i was able to blast a lot of in real life support group action within the first three months and that was and that was absolutely key for me actually and I know it doesn't fit everyone and I think a lot of people are put off by the, the sort of the words and the linguistics around spiritual fellowships but I think you, I think for me that was the only thing that helped me and I was able to look beyond the the kind of the goddy stuff, basically. I'm just going to say it, the goddy stuff. Um, and it, you know, it completely saved my life and it and it helped me. You know, I felt like, um, you know, I, I looked up. I feel like sobriety for me is like looking at, looking up at like um, a looking glass and not knowing what was on the other side and just sort of putting my hand up to the glass and allowing someone to pull through, pull me through and carry me on the shoulders of a, you know thousands of other recovering alcoholics until I was strong enough to stand on my own and that's that's the way that I can describe early recovery for me because I just didn't know um yeah look um you know the religious aspect I found quite difficult I'm an atheist but oh god do you want to hear about them oh god uh I feel like we're going into dark territory now ah uh, look, the God thing has been a big problem for me. Like, I found it really difficult to come to terms with that element of the path that I've chosen to go down my recovery um, and the element of prayer and all that stuff. And the, this sort of that stuff really jars with me. It really does jar with me. But for me, and um, it was something that almost made me go back out and start drinking again. For me, the only way that I've learned how to deal with it is 
realize I'm a control freak by nature. I'm a control freak by nature. And if I can find a way to stop getting stressed, I can't control what everyone in this world is doing. I can't control all that stuff. The only thing that I control, control is me. And so the only thing I, when it comes to sort of that sort of spiritual stuff, which is part of some recovery programs, all I know is I'm not in charge. So therefore stop worrying about it so much. Do you know what I mean? And just do the best that I can in my own small way, put it out into the universe and just allow whatever will be to be, if that makes sense. And that was the way that I mentally got over uh, the religious sort of roadblock that, that hampered me in, in, the, in the fellowship that I'm in at the moment. <sighs> that was an awkward bump to ride, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, your higher power is anything you can make sense of. Look, for me, it was about um, stop thinking I can control things because I think it was stopping me do things. You know, uh, the fear within myself, like me before recovery, now everything I do is because of me, but because you know, and everything I achieve is because of me, because of the effort that I put in. But previously, I, I got things despite of myself. Like you know, I would just almost like try and ruin it just because I didn't want to feel invested, and I, I was fearful of failure. But now I feel like I've got a more honest, um, a more honest way of kind of moving through life. Um, what else? Oh, okay, right. So what that bit, that bit was hard. Blah, blah. Um, in terms of like um, the terminology of illness and disease, meh, I have a little bit of a problem with that terminology personally. For me, alcohol and drugs is a way that I deal with inner anxiety and um, recovery has been about finding a way to manage that inner anxiety, uh, that inner fear, um, and and move through it and it's really hard it's really fucking hard you know it's really fucking hard I'm not gonna fucking lie to you it's hard it's hard you know um, meditation I find really good um, or oh, I, I don't do enough of it though but I find it really good because it calms that mental what I notice is my mind is really busy like it's super busy I can get very especially in the first year I felt very like Ooh, very, I get very like, ooh, very angry, very sort of like overly obsessed in the minute details of things and I'd blow it up. And uh, meditation has helped me um, calm that mind. Also, other stuff that's helped me is um, writing a gratitude list. I would suggest, you know, maybe three or four of you bundle up and you write a daily gratitude list and send it to each other. That for me has been helpful because it helps me realign that inner critic my inner critic oh she hates me my inner critic absolutely hates me she hates me like my inner critic will say sit like sit outside the house of myself and tell me the worst things about myself that not even my worst enemy would tell me so a gratitude list helps me sort of change the sort of the way that i look at life and look at the positives so i you know trying to change it from a heart glass half full to a glass no a glass half empty <laughs> to a glass half full mentality um yeah i don't like the, the terminology illness and disease I, I, I feel like that's a bit outdated i feel like i think that i think that i don't think that i sat on a toilet seat and caught something <laughs> i don't think oh god i just caught just caught alcoholism guys I don't think that was the case. I think that that's just the way that I, I'm built. I like alcohol. I like extreme, full-on experiences. It doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be sex. It can be social media. It can be work. If I can get a hit out of it, I will chase it. I will chase it. And that's and that that brings me on to my next sort of like thing I wanted to talk about, which um, I know that you know some of you guys talk about the different like. I'm a believer of abstinence, like I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't moderate, I can't moderate, <laughs> I can't moderate around booze, like, and I think it's really ridiculous to suggest to me, my personal opinion, that I can moderate, I tried moderating, I tried moderating, there's a couple of times in the last year before I gave up that I tried to moderate, and I was like, I, I remember I, I was uh, I was trying to get fit, so I was like, I'm and my I had a personal an online personal trainer, and he was like, you can't drink alcohol. And I was like, what? No, I've got to drink alcohol. Like, 
you know, I work, you know, I, I work in clubs. I've got to drink alcohol. And he was like, no. And I, and I got back to the end of the week one, and I was like, I dr- only drunk fourteen units. And he was like, that's drinking. <laughs> and so I just gave it all up and just went on a massive, massive three day binge afterwards. So I, I, for me, abstinence has worked. You know, um, moderation. I, do, I don't even know how I could moderate from a point of extremity. I, d- I don't know. I don't. I don't. For me personally, I don't think that's possible. I couldn't do that. Um, and, and 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 that's the same for like alcohol-free beers and all that business. That's like a gateway drug. I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to go there because I know I'll be like, oh, this is. Oh, it tastes like beer. It's got no alcohol in. Oh yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just have one. Shall I I'll just have one? Yeah. I mean, what harm can it do? And then you know, I'd end up on a three-day bender. So for me, like abstinence for the moment is working and um, I, I can't moderate. I can't moderate. Like I, I did my show, Walk of Shame, and I, when I wrote that and, and, and worked on that, like I couldn't moderate around that. You know, I had a real problem with Tinder and dating apps for a while. I can't moderate around that. I've, I have to be careful about how much porn I watch. Like I can't moderate around that. So like... You want to, you know, you want to tell me that I can moderate around booze? No, no chance. Um, um, what do I think now? I, yeah, I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to break down um, my recovery in, um, in, uh, in years. So I've been sober, like, nearly three years, which is amazing. Um, I would say the first three months are like giddy. You're like on a pink cloud, you're a little bit giddy, you're like, woo, 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 like that all the time. Um, but for the first year, I would just feel intense emotions for like a month at a time. Like, but I would, I would, I would go through like going, just getting really angry. Like I was really angry, like for ages, like angry about everything, everyone, everything, like just properly exploring the range of, of, of how I could feel about anger. Or it would be like complete, wow, like amazement or like complete weepiness or complete horniness, which is quite common in the first year. Um, But you know what I mean? Like properly, like just intense emotions. And that happened for the first year. And then and then it just kind of like evened out. It just really evened out after that. It was all right. You know, I don't crave a drink now. I um. You know, I, I don't I don't go to as many meetings as I did probably like once a week. And that's OK for me. If, I, if I'm feeling a bit weird, I'll go to more. Um, I've got friends that are sober. That's really helpful. I, 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 I've weeded out the ones that I like and I will call them because you're not really going to like it. Just because you're all together in sobriety doesn't mean you're going to like everyone. Um, but that was really helpful. Um, yeah, everything's everything's all right now, you know, and I think that that's pretty natural, isn't it? It's um, you know, if you're using alcohol or drugs or whatever to uh, moderate your moods or find a way to kind of deal with stuff, then obviously it's going to take a while for you when you take that away to kind of recalibrate. And that's why I feel like drinking during that early recovery is really weird because like, how can you get reset if you're still you've still got it in there? I, d- I don't know, but um. Um, yeah, that, that, that first, that first year is, is just like, it's up and down, really up and down. Bits of crying, really upset. I mean, it's the first time that you probably felt life, uh, without booze, without wine, Prosecco, uh, beer, whiskey, tequila, gin. I mean, I love it all, but, um, and it's, yeah, it's the first, yeah, it's the first time you've even felt life. It's the most amount of emotional development that you've done since you were a teenager, essentially isn't it you know um and that's funny isn't it you didn't need alcohol when you were a kid what makes it a thing that you need when you're an alcohol uh, an adult it's weird um what do i think now yeah i'm happy i'm a happy you know sober person sometimes i do think uh oh, will i be able to drink again is it forever well i sometimes think about that is it forever is it forever is it forever? Well, I quite like my life now, right? 
Uh, and I know that there's still an inner sort of addictive tendency. And at the moment it's manifesting itself through sex and dating a little bit, not so much as it used to, but mainly within work. Um, and I think that probably if I drank again, I would definitely use that as a conduit for that addictive energy. That might, that addictive energy might end up, thank you for the smiley face around the sex chat. But, um, you know, I do think that if I went back to boozing or, or partying, then, um, then those, then those tendencies would, would unlock themselves. And, you know, you know, um, what do I think now? So um, I know quite a few of you have, hang on, I'm just going to take a, take a sip of this carbonated beverage, Buxton, sparkling water, other waters are available. <laughs> um, so I wrote this show called Walk of Shame, which I know a couple of you have seen, and that, um, that's something that I, I did in early recovery. I, I had this story and I wanted to tell people and I felt like, I wanted to make my mark and um, I'd never been a, com you know, I kind of bullshitted about being a comedian, but I hadn't really put pen to paper. Okay, Barbara's just put a comment. I find it interesting that you talk about drinking in the present tense rather than the past tense. E.g. I enjoy drinking. No judgment. Thanks, Bubs. Just an observation. Yeah, man, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love the ritual. There's a ritual element to the drinking, right? Just as there is when you're trying to stalk someone on Tinder or when you're looking for porn or you're looking for a sexual partner or there's just a ritual that I find really sexy. Uh, I talk about it in my show. You should come and see it. Um, but there is a ritual around it, like champagne, right? Champagne has got sexy ritual around it. It's a sexy glass. It suggests um, sort of like high kudos. It's got the bubbles. You've got to unwrap it. It's a it's a it's a pop. It's there's the bubbles everywhere. You've got the tall slender glasses. Da -da -da. You know, I think that's why prosecco is so so popular because it's that cheap ideology of what it you know what it means to be sophisticated and sexy and, and elegant and classy and all that business. And that makes you feel special, doesn't it? Uh, and I think there's lots of ritual. Yeah, I love, I love drinking. I love, I'm not going to lie, I love it. I love, I love drinking. I love being pissed. But I can't be trusted. <laughs> I can't be trusted. I think, um, look, I think it's important to realise, like, if you, if, you, if you feel like your life is unmanageable with alcohol in it, then, then find an alternative. You know, come to a meeting, reach out to the social group that you've got on this on on Club Soda. Find what suits you best, and you know there is a, there is a way of living your life sober and being happy. Like I'm happy, I'm really happy. I'm happy, guys. I'm really happy. Like I'm happy. Like I'd still go out. Like my fourth day of sobriety, I went to Glastonbury for four days. I mean, I wouldn't recommend doing that in the first week because it was mental, but. I did start, you know, I could see my, my behaviour reflected in other people's behaviour and that was a bit of an off-putting because the glamour got really, you know, got, didn't seem, it didn't seem that glamorous anymore. Um, I've got some advice for um, if you want to go out and, and be sober free. Um, I would say have people that you can call but when you're feeling a bit shaky so I don't know how you guys do it but you know I, I have a few people in my phone that I will call um, help someone else you know help someone that's been sober less time than you and, and reach out to them and see if you can help them because we're really self-absorbed alcoholics are so self-absorbed I am self-absorbed I know I am self-absorbed um, so you know trying to look at outward and, and kind of help someone else is it's a nice way of getting your mind out of your self-absorbed self. Um, write a gratitude list. I find that quite helpful to sort of really shift the skewer of how you look at life and how you look at your own life. You know, your life isn't half empty, it's half full. Okay. Meditation, I would definitely recommend meditating. Like there's some, there's some really, really great apps out there like Headspace. Calm is the one that I really like. It's just so nice. You just go to sleep and it like, I don't know, you just like, you can listen to it while you're commuting, listen to the sounds of rain on leaves, it's very lovely. Um, 
oh, if you want to still go out, still go out. But I have got some tips. Make sure you call someone before or make sure you can call someone during the night. Give yourself a two hour maximum. Okay, so if you're going to a party, get there early, right? People will be pissed by 10.30. Nothing, no one will remember. No one will remember you not being there after 10.30. Believe me, they're not going to. If someone asks you to go to a party and they're a drinker, bring a third person, okay? You don't want to be responsible for someone else's night because you might go there and after half an hour, you might, feel, you might not be feeling it. You know what I mean? You might not be feeling it. You just want to go in and out, especially in early recovery. You need to control your environment. You need to control how you slot into that environment. So go out in a three. So at least your mate has another mate they can go off with and enjoy the night. They're not going to be like, oh, don't go. Oh, God, I don't want to be on my own. And then you feel really guilty. Um, I always ghost. When I'm going, I just do a quick, I just, I just disappear. I just disappear now. I'm a, I'm a ghost. I don't, otherwise, you have to go, um, I'm going now, guys. And everyone's like, oh, don't go, don't go, don't go. And it's, you get stuck in the loop of don't go for like an hour. Um, yeah, that, that's a pretty much my top tips, actually. Um, that's pretty much it, I think. I think that's all I've really got. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any sort of questions they wanted to ask. I'm going to have a little scroll. <laughs> I'm going to have a little scroll, guys. Scrolly, scrolly, scroll. Scroll, scroll. Scroll, 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 scroll. Hey, Shazza, crammed six months into a Friday night. Barbara, Barbara, Barbara. Hey, Gary. All right, Gaza. Thanks. Sharon, yes, your higher power is anyone. Anything that you can make sense of. For a while, um, my higher power is Ed Sheeran. So he got me through. I was like, dear Ed Sheeran. No, I wasn't. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, hey, Rachel. Hi, hi, Rachel. Okay, cool. Kim, Dawn, Janet. Yeah. And I, is that an Irish goodbye? Do we have any questions before I go? Anyone got any questions? Oh, crap. I've got to promote my show. Right, I'm doing a show. <laughs> I'm doing a show, right, called Walk of Shame, and it's basically about the extremes that go into my life and um, basically early recovery, basically. And loads of you have been coming to see the show, and I really appreciate it. And I know a few of you um, have set up like um, have set up like sort of uh, groups to come and see the show. As I'm on tour, I'm going all around the country. So look, I really appreciate your support, and you know having nutters like me in the audience really really does make a great show because you know exactly where i'm coming from so look i'd really love to see you at a, a show sometime soon uh you can find all the details at eleanorconway.com i am doing two extra shows on may 11th and july 6th in london if you're london bound please do um check them out because i haven't sold many tickets yet <laughs> But, um, aha, yeah, Ed Sheeran was my higher power. Um, and that's pretty much it. Look, if you want to, if you've got any questions, I'm on Facebook, Eleanor Conway UK, uh, and I'm on Twitter, and I'm, I'm more than happy to sort of, um, you know, speak to you, or, or, you know, Laura can give you my details, or I don't know, you can pass it on, I don't know. Um, yeah, Rachel's coming to Guildford! What? Good, thanks, Charlotte. Okay, so... July 6th is at the Century Club in Soho. It's a members club, darling. It's a mem and it's Gay Pride, so hopefully everyone's going to be up for it. Um, so that's exciting. And then May 11th, I'm doing like a late night sort of pre-tour uh, version at the Bill Murray in Angel. And I'm doing Edinburgh again this year with the show. So look, like, this show saved your life, basically. You know, it's given me the idea of consistency. I never used to be consistent before. And that sort of idea of doing a little bit each day, you can build something great. And that is also, a, you know, it's a model for my recovery. I do a bit each day. I keep it in the day. I make sure I go to bed sober that night. And that's, and that's you know, you do that enough times and you stack up the days. And I just want to like let you say, look, it does get easier. It gets a lot easier. Okay. You can have a rough few months at the start, up and down, but that is absolutely normal. Um... But it does get easier and it's it's better. I don't 
I don't miss the hangovers. I don't miss the aroma of regret as I, as I start to think about the memories from the night before and I'm trying to push them out of my mind because I'm too embarrassed and I'm cringing so much. Like I don't miss any of that stuff. It's, you know, it's a much better life for me and I'm, I'm really happy and um, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for supporting me, Club So. Thanks a lot to Laura as well and, um, you know, hopefully I'll see you at a show soon.